there stays up there on that ceiling, eh? It is not by the power of prayer or double-sided sticky tape. <laughs> there is a long threaded bolt through that chandelier. We're round at the garages. Right. Here, while you're there, give the... We're going to get paid. Look, his lordship is away on holiday. He'll pay us when he gets back. Now, come on. Get these ladders up. Yeah, you never know. Might be in for a bonus. Oh, yeah. Oh, found it, Dill. Yeah, I see he's found the nut. I told you we could trust him. Right, come on, get this out. I'm starting to undo it. Yeah. No! <laughs> come on, Benny, we ain't even up the letters yet. Granddad, don't you touch nothing till we tell you. <laughs> come on, you better get up there. Right, Rodney, is there anything you want? Yeah, I want to go home. I'm <laughs> not too safe. That is all right. Look, this is the chance I've been waiting for. Now don't let me down, Rodney. Now don't let me down. Right? I'm going to stop it there. They're going, these two are going to take the chandelier down and clean it for half the price. Okay? So they're going to take this thing down. All right, so there you go. All right, Granddad, we're ready. You can start undoing it now. He's coming, Bill boy. Turn, Dill. Right. Now brace yourself, Rodney. Brace yourself. Um, now that was rated, I think, the funniest scene in television. And it's about the unexpected. And that's about creativity as well to do something unexpected. Um, books and bookshops, we can't pass. Our favorite bookshop in San Francisco. And I thought I'd show you an interesting book. It's called Pi. All right? Now, why do I find it interesting? It's Pi to One Million Decimal Places. It's a Japanese book, OK? On the first page, you see the first row is Pi to 100 Decimal Places. It goes down on this page, OK? to 44,000. Um, there are 10,000 on the first page. And now I'm going to go to 10 pages at a time. 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 And here we are, basically, at the end. That's a million. That's only a million. We've lost our understanding of what a million actually is. It's a lot. A million dollars is a lot of money, right? And the last number, the millionth decimal place, is one. And also Japanese humor is 314 yen. Okay. So that's a book I find interesting. I'm going to tell you something about numbers, which people have forgotten. A favorite book is All Over Coffee, Pictures and Drawings of San Francisco. And I like the statements. Set your ideals to those of the image of your idol, pull your collar tight and walk into the storm. Take a stand and automatically you have a supporter and an enemy. The problem today is that too few people are prepared to take a stand against the inhumanity that we see in many other aspects of, that we see today. And so those are the aspects in books. So what am I doing? I try to do something and one thing that I'm doing is setting up a project called GEOSET, G-E-O-S-E-T, Global Educational Outreach for Science, Engineering, and Technology. We use a capture station. We have a video and a PowerPoint. I don't need to be here. I now go to India more three or four times a year by internet, okay? And in fact, we use these to do this. And I want to show you what our students do, okay? Our students are fantastic at it. Here are the Beatles. George, John, Ringo, and Paul. We all know their music, and most of us even know of their impact on the world today. However, whether we realize it or not, we've had more contact with another type of Beatle, and they have had far more influence on our very lives. And I'm talking about these Beatles, the insects. And this presentation will be all about the wonderful world of Beatles. It turns out that students are very good at creating educational material, okay? 
That's an undergraduate. Here is a research student. Hi, my name is Kerry Gilmore, and I am a graduate student here at Florida State University. I work for Dr. Al Bugan as a, an organic chemist. Now, I love organic chemistry because it provides you the opportunity to go through and be an architect, an engineer, a builder, because you can go through and you, we can really look at designing molecules. We can figure out how to actually make these molecules. Let's stop it there. I can make it an architect and an engineer on a molecular scale, on a nanoscale. So you don't have to be an architect. You get the same thrill out of getting building a structure on a nanoscale as you can on a large scale. And it's sometimes a lot cheaper as well. Okay. And I'm going to jump on because I want to show you um, if I can pull this over. Okay, let, us, let me get it going. It's, um, we make these molecules and then finally we actually get to go into lab and actually build these things. Now, the greatest organic chemist by far is nature. Nature can go through and take something as utterly simplistic as these small seeds and through a series of organic transformations using chemistry that we ourselves use, uh, it's able to go through and transform it into these beautifully complex and beautiful flowers that you can see here. Now, what we do is much the same. We'll take something relatively small, something relatively simplistic, and through a series of transformations, we need to figure out how to make something that's much larger, much more complex. We're going to jump on. And if we look at that last structure there, with the last radical before our reaction finishes, it goes through, and it looks like if we were to add more triple bonds in this case, we could go through and fully zip up these structures. We could go through and take something, instead of just something that's relatively small, and close it up. We can extend that all the way through and form much longer chains. And I'm going to jump on now because we're running out of time. And uh, oops, this is becoming a bit erratic, but they can get around that. We've got projects on wolves. And for, for teachers, look at what we've done for assessment. Okay, Instead of a pile of papers that you have to mark and give you a headache, you can sit and drinking a glass of wine and watch the student giving a presentation. We've revolutionized the resume as well. We've put our students on the top because we send the URL of their presentation and Kerry just got a, a, goal, um, a um, Fulbright Award. And here is our Hall of Fame. There's the Fulbright Award. Steve got, got us a Rich Media Award by doing a fantastic presentation on the internet. Prajna got four tenure track offers. Brittany got into uh, medical school. She said the GSET presentation was the defining factor. She said, I think it helped me get my position. Pra uh, our trees, I did the interview. She walked in and they said, we enjoyed your presentation on the internet. She was put at her ease almost immediately. Jennifer got into vet school. Dan got a Goldwater scholarship. You know, you've got his job at NHK. And this is interesting for you here. So I know is a, an Indian student who was in Japan, a postdoc, and she sent the URL of her presentation on the internet to the Mahatma Gandhi University and she was hired as a professor. And Mark Riley sent the data up to NSF so that the NSF who were funding the students could see who they were funding. It works. And Steve Aqua, Sam Rustin, Karen and Penny are people helping me. Helping me. Right. The last part. There are, if you become scientists or anything, you should be involved with organizations that are something to do with responsibility. And this is just one, the International Network of Engineers and Scientists for Global Responsibility. If you're a physicist, we don't need any more atomic bombs. If you're a chemist, we don't need any more napalm. And if you're an engineer, we don't need any more landmines. You can look and see little kiddies with one leg blown off by a landmine playing soccer on crutches, dreaming of going to the paraplegic Olympic Games. We don't need any more of that. Leon Lederman, Nobel Prize in Physics in eight years, he, said, he sent me an email. He said, Harry, you see a lot of young people. Can you say this for me? So many years have passed, and the human race is saddled with enough nuclear weapons to destroy the planet. We must redouble our efforts to unify the science community against this huge stupidity. It's not just the science community. It's the whole community. 
Scientists are only one or two percent of this community. The one or two percent who created this place. Computers, lasers, the, the paint on the wall, the material on the floor, the lights and the electricity was created by one or two percent of the world. It needs to be 95 percent of them. Joe Rotblatt became a very close friend in the last few years of his life. He was the greatest man I knew personally. And here he is. He was actually the only um, scientist to leave the Manhattan Project. And uh, before the, the bomb was actually finished, if only they'd all left it, it wasn't necessary. In his Nobel address, he says, we appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. The quest for a war-free world has a basic purpose, survival. But if in the process we learn to achieve it by love rather than by fear, great lines, by kindness rather than by compulsion, if in the process we learn to combine the essential with the enjoyable, the expedient with the beautiful, the practical with the beautiful, this will be an extra incentive to embark on this great task. Above all, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And here is Joe. He got the Peace Prize with Pugwash because he spent more or less all the rest of his life as an, uh, from about the age of 30 to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And here he is in his office where we recorded interviews with him. And look at this. How is that staying up? I just do <laughs> not know. It's something else. My favorite poster, when, when I first saw it, I fell in love with this poster. What is it? OK. I'm an alien creature. I was sent from another planet with a message of goodwill from my people. The message says, dear Earth people, when you finally at last destroy your planet and have no place to live, you can come and live with us. And we will teach you how to live in peace and harmony. And we will give you a coupon good for 10% of all deep dish pizzas, too. <laughs> Sincerely, Bob. Three things. Destruction of the planet. I'm a scientist. I'm not sure. Not very sure. But it don't look good. I think we could be. And because I think we could be, we must err on the side of caution. We must do everything we can to ensure that we're not making things worse. We're not doing that. That's what bothers me. Only one thing. Peace and harmony. I'm sure about this. Is it not incredible that we cannot solve our problems without sitting down together and not making, uh, trying to solve our problems by sending young people to go and kill each other day in, day out? There are 27, 29 wars going on at the present time. Okay, basically terrorist wars of all kinds. We're in the 21st century with weapons of mass destruction. And we can't solve our problems by sitting down together when you know it, it makes sense to do that. But there is a third thing, and it's the pizza and a sense of humor. And without a sense of humor, life's not worth living, at least not as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to finish now with an aspect of education that I want you to think about. It's my favorite cartoon about education, and it comes from Peanuts, Snoopy. I got a C in Kotanga sculpture. How could anyone get C in Kotanga sculpture? May I ask a question? Was I judged on the piece of sculpture itself? If so, is it not true that time alone can judge a work of art? Or was I judged on my talent? If so, is it right that I'd be judged on part of my life over which I have no control? Was I judged on my effort? Then I was judged unfairly, for I tried as hard as I could. Was I judged on what I had learned about this project? If so, then were not you, my teacher, also being judged on your ability to transmit your knowledge to me? Are you willing to share in my sea? Te <laughs> Teachers love this one, right? Perhaps I was judged 
on the quality of the coat hanger itself out of which my creation was made. Now is this also not unfair? Am I to be judged on the quality of the coat hangers that are used by the dry cleaning establishment that returns our garment? Is that not the responsibility of my parents? Should they not share in my seat? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. But let's see what Sally asks. How could anyone get C in coat hanger sculpture? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the most amazing coat hanger sculpture you could ever imagine. In 2010, the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, and if you're in London in the summer, you must go to the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. It's a, a cultural sort of cult in England. There was a coat hanger sculpture, and there you'll see, well, there are a few coat hangers. We all agree with that. However, let's have a look at what it is. That's a coat hanger sculpture. And I use this for young people to think, whenever you do a project, you start the project and you look at the gorilla and say, I'm going to do something that no one else other than I could have imagined. Something that is an A plus, 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 plus. And Sally should have got a Z by comparison. This is an amazing, I think it's one of the most amazing pieces of imagination I've ever seen. And when you do anything, think, how, whatever project it is, think about the gorilla and say, how can I do something as amazing like this? And the way to do this in Tudel is something to do with attitude. Just look at this little boy. Margaret took this photograph of this little boy that I showed you at the beginning. Totally engrossed in what they're doing. And education is about this. He's not caring about prizes and Nobel Prizes or what else. It's the moment, hands-on creating something that's happening. And it's about attitude. The simple recipe of success is when you do an assignment, make sure you give it the best shot. If you're satisfied with second-rate effort, look for something else where only the best effort you can do will satisfy you, not the teacher, you personally, you yourself. If you do this all the time, you will invariably find you will do everything better than other people who might have been able to do better because maybe they're smarter, they're people smarter than I am, and they're never going to win the Nobel Prize. Not that that's important. I never set out to win the Nobel Prize. I didn't want to do things which were important. I wanted to do things that I wanted to do. And it turned out, in one of the most unimportant experiments before we did it, it turned out to be one of the most important experiments. Just do what you're interested in doing. If you do that, you'll do better than other people, and it's called determination. Okay. So there it is. I'm only here to make you think. Thank you. Wow. Wow. I cannot find any words to say that was a passionate and marvelous speech. Yes, remarkable. What do you think, Dr. Chiani? Well, I must say, Professor, your lecture took us back through our youthful memories, especially the olifus and horses and peanuts. <laughs> and um, it merely states the beauty of life. And a picture is worth a, th a thousand words. And what you have shown us today worth more than a million. And from here, I will give it my best shot, Professor. Thank you very much. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please give another big round of applause to Professor Proto, please. And now I think it has come to the question and answer question. I will give the floor to our audience who would probably would like to ask Professor Croto a question. Any questions or welcome? Please just raise your hand if you have one in mind. Our staff will bring the microphone to you, or you can come to the microphone that's set up on the other side. Please okay, raise I your hand. I usually discover people are speechless after my talk, but so, I'm not. Yeah. Okay, while we are waiting for the question from the floor, may I have the honor to start one off, Professor? If we were, or if we have been educated in principles and tradition and discipline, what is the first step to, in making creativity? Well, I, I mean, I did mention it. I think that uh, 
what uh, you have to do is look at a, a problem and try to see it in your own personal way. I think it's not a, you, you mustn't, um, you can look at what others have done and basically steal it, you know, and present it in another way. I mean, Picasso actually did in one, of, let me see whether I can find this, um, if we take this down, whoops, no, I didn't want to do that, I'm gonna go back into it, okay. Um, I, I need to be here, actually, I don't know quite why it's gone there. And now we go up, oh, curious, okay, we'll go to this. Um, Picasso said something which uh, applies, I think, to this. Uh, let me see whether I can find it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where is Picasso? He's somewhere here, I think. Hmm. Very odd. Very strange. It seems to have disappeared. Oh, there he is. Okay, fine. Okay, this is um, Picasso's contribution to creativity, and this is basically the bad artists imitate, the great artists steal. Okay. Very good. Um, it's actually a bit facetious, and it's crossed out, and it says Banksy there, who's an artist as well. And what it's really telling you is that um, you look at what others have done and see it in a different way. But try to do it in your own personal way. And in fact, uh, to some extent, I, I showed you this logo. Um, and, and I think it, I show it because I rather like that logo. And I'll, I'll just do it again um, because um, it seems to me that it epitomizes the sort of things that the way I think. Um, and uh, I showed it and basically for this one that I saw these two images, a K and then the pencil, and put them together. And they're bo I like them both very much, but I put them together in a different way. And it's, um, again, I think uh, one of Pasteur's statements, to see what others have seen, but think what no one has thought, okay? And that means you have to um, develop your own personal way of looking at the world. Um, and jump forward. In science, we, we can't move without what other people have done. So it's not so much of stealing, it's but looking at what they've done and then seeing how that might apply, you might apply that in a different way. And bring your own expertise to that, okay? You get the idea? Okay. Thank you very much for such a good answer. Yes, sir. Please lady. raise your hand and do state your name prior to the questions. At the All school right. today, the only people who asked questions were the women. Please, so I Mr. Think Chancellor. Very interesting. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Are there still men and women? I thought we were all unisex. Pardon? Are there still men and women? I thought we are in the age of unisex. <laughs> you can't hear me? I can. I'm, I'm going deaf, so I'm sort of. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but I'm I'm Ponchili Ashwabrung, and I'm from the Raystone University. I was just mentioning that you said only women asking the question. Yes, it was So I, I just, in the era of being doubtful, so I said, don't you think that we are in the age of unisex? In the age of unisex, no men and women? Yeah. In the unisex? Yes. Yes, I think so, yes. But I, I, I found here in Thailand, they, uh, in, in the school this morning, the only um, students who asked questions were all the women. And so uh, I think you've made a great improvement on uh, that. They are the ones who really are asking and maybe questions. So yes, but I, I hope some of the boys would do, but they were, they were too shy. <laughs> I'm so moved, touched, and inspired by your one concept of freedom to doubt. Yes, it's not and mine. That, and that hits, hits, hits me right on the dot, yes. the freedom to doubt. And as a professor and a Nobel laureate, I would like to ask you to please share how you could nurture the freedom to doubt in the young minds. And first of all, since I, I feel that I'm forever young, even though I'm in my 60s, all right? <laughs> so I'm doubtful of what you have shared with us earlier, because you did mention that there are three senses. And since I'm so young, I jotted down four senses. So I want to know what are the three senses that you were mentioning. Before. What are the the three senses? Oh, because uh, the, okay, I jotted down yes. four senses. Common sense, 
is one. Yes. Uncommon sense. Right. And common nonsense. What about a sense nonsense of humor? Nonsense is common now. What about the common, the sense of humor? You did mention that too. Well, that's, that's another humor. thing. But th my three senses were common sense, non-common non sense, sense, and, and common nonsense. nonsense. And nonsense. Thank you very that's much. That's the third one. Says, Please. But the, 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 the freedom to doubt is perhaps more important. And I think that means that the, that presents the teacher with a big problem because they have to have courage, the courage to enable their students to question what the, you're teaching them. And that means that when you've made a mistake, that you were able to admit that to the class. And that's a difficult problem. And I have problems with that too. So I try to make sure that when I teach, I don't make too many mistakes. But I make mistakes. And one of the most important aspects of a scientist to recognize that mistakes are made and when you make them, that you can admit them. And that the students realize that uh, the teaching is not about the teacher being correct, but teaching the method whereby you learn. And I remember very often, very strongly when I, when I came home from school and I said to my father, you know, I, you know, this is not right. And he said, it's not for the teacher to be right all the time. They're human beings, people make mistakes. To understand that mistakes are going to be made and that you, first of all, if you make them, you make sure that, yes, I made a mistake and can admit that. And that's a, a good lesson, not just for me, but for the students. And I, I find it more, uh, difficult as well. But it is a challenge that the teacher must really instill in young people doubt and questioning. Because without those, the human race is stuck. And I think a lot of it is stuck. And I think that's one of the problems that we face today. That dogma is controlling many of the actions of countries and large groups of people. Um, and it bothers me. Thank you. Another question from Professor Dr. Krotsay, Shunak Wong. One here and then the lady there, okay. Professor Kotto, it might be too difficult for me to ask any question, but I would like to say that uh, you are a great leader. When I say great leader, it means uh, I just come back from Indonesia and this year, the teachers, they, they said, uh, the teacher is a leader. I better come closer. <laughs> <laughs> a teacher is a leader. Yes. So you are a great teacher yes. and great leader. No, I wish I were. I mean, that's going, and yes. When I, I try. Yeah, when I say uh, you are a great teacher because you are trying to help us to know something without teaching. Yeah. You are not teaching, but you help us to learn. Okay. And help us to think. I, I'm sure I can't help you. I, but, uh, <laughs> I, I help you, but you can help me. Yeah. At the same time, when I say you are a great leader, it's uh, according to my definition. A leader is always add value to the other people. You add value to many people, including okay. the audience. Okay, thank you. The second part is you add value to your work. So we understand your work easily. At the, at the same time, you add value to yourself that you give us to understand that to be a great leader, you have to know everything in something and know something in everything, you see. Right. This is, uh, I believe that the audience agree with me. Why not give him a big pause? <laughs> Join me, yeah. You. Appreciate your lecture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Please do state your name prior to the question, uh, please. Yes, uh, my name is Rosemary Wanchupela uh, of Rosemary Academy. And I just would like to ask you um, why the scientific community doesn't put more uh, research thought into how you achieve peace and how nonviolence actually works and how it can be an answer to some of the problems we face. 
I came here to this country 51 years ago as a member of the Peace Corps, United States Peace Corps. Peace Corps. We celebrated our 50th anniversary and it was on volunteerism in Thailand, not about peace. That's 50 years ago. And I just, since the time of Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, I just don't see much research and effort going into finding peace. Develop, I mean, it, it's like, it, for the military, we invest billions. Now I know our American government doesn't, the amount of money we give for research is less than it was, and the universities aren't getting what they need for research. But it seems to me with all the, the, the emphasis, bridges for peace, this is what brought me here today more than anything, and I just don't see those bridges being built unless we really put some effort into it. And I wanted to know what you might think about that as a scientist. Well, I mean, I, I do think that this many scientists do work for peace. Joe Rotblatt, Leon Lederman, and others, and people like Richard Feynman and others have talked about this. But um, peace is not a scientific issue. Um, it's a social issue. And I think, as I said in the last part of my talk, um, I really don't understand how it is that we somehow, from our political um, uh, sort of infrastructure, that we produce leaders who can't sit down, find it almost impossible to sit down at a table and discuss the problems that we have. I find this quite incredible in the 21st century. Um, I do think that the, among the, the scientists I know, and a lot, I know a lot of Nobel Prize winners, people like Elie Wiesel and others, and Joe Rotblatt, these are people who did work for peace, okay? Um, and I think, uh, I think we've done as a, a reasonable job, but we're a very small number group of people. I said, about probably one, the number of people who have doctorates in science is about one or a percent of the population. I think the problem is in education. How is it that we still, through our educational programs, um, can produce people who find that the only solution to um, international problems are belligerent ones? I think we have to look at um, some parts of the world where um, dogma is being uh, distributed, a dogma of um, antagonism to groups who are not the same as ourselves. I'm in the USA and I, I don't like nationalism and patriotism. The, the, I think uh, it's a country which seems to value this, but it's not really a value because the survival today is a global issue. America will not survive without recognizing that it's part of the human race. And I think there are political, social, and financial structures are highly uh, nationalistic. I see this uh, Britain, you know, has to do this, that, and the other to, to do well. And I, there are uh, lots of uh, socio-economic and socio-political issues which I find uh, very disturbing. Um, in, I lived in the States. Um, about the Kennedy time. And I think the biggest thing that I know between then and now is that being liberal is a dirty word. And liberalism is scientific. It's being open and thinking about things. Whereas, um, um, and I think this bothers me that something that I hold dear to the way I think to be open and, qu and questioning and uh, recognizing that uh, for the world to survive, we have to work on an international level and work with people throughout the world because what is best for America and Britain and Europe is the same as what is best for Asian countries and South African countries and South American countries. So those are the issues that, and I don't think they're scientific ones. I think they're socio-economic and socio-political ones. And there's something to do with dogma accepting dogma, which is just a human construct. I think there are religious issues, there are, as much as there are political ones. Um, and I think um, 
until we get that straight, I think we've got a very serious problem for young people in the future. Uh, and I'm you. worried. I mean, I'm, I mean, I used to say that I used to be an optimist. Well, I, you know, the, the Leonard Cohen said uh, in Rolling Stone, he said, uh, uh, "No, I'm." This guy said, "You're a pessimist." He said, "No, no, no, a pessimist. I think of a pessimist as someone who's waiting for it to rain." I'm drenched to the skin. And I say, well, you know, I'm an optimist. Why is that? Well, I'll be well out of here when the shit really hits the fan. That's my level of optimism. And I think our young people deserve that. I think, I think we really do have to work. We have to get leaders, and we have to take our leaders and make sure they sit down. The Obamas and the, um, um, uh, you know, Putin, have got to come together. The Chinese leaders have got to come together. Because what sort of example is that for our young people? The Japanese and Chinese having a problem there. Netanyahu and Hamas on the other side. How can we expect a future of peace when our leaders can't sit down at the table together? And that's why I love Joe Rutland. I mean, he was revered by people on both sides, and Gorbachev and others who recognized how hard he worked for the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. And something that Uwe here is working for, to bring us, to try to get people from the US and all over the world to come here and say to young people that we've got to work together. Because unless we do that, we're not going to really solve the problems. I, it's not a scientific one. It's a socio-political, I think religious one at the present time. That, so that's a problem because very people are, what they believe is very important to them. But I worry about the organization that takes advantage of what they believe, the organizations that believe in conservatism or socialism and stuff like that, because these are something to do with society. And I, I think those aspects are taken advantage of by people at the tops of these organizations. And that, that's not the way it should be. But Thank I don't you. have a, an, an answer. Uh, I'm just waffling away here. <laughs> Thank you very much. May I have another, que there another two questions? Left? There's a young man at the, the back. The man at the back, please. OK, yes. OK, yes. Any okay. staff could come to help him, please. To, um, yeah, I'm Skon Chai Chanunan from Faculty of Education and I'm um, specialized in chemical education. Can you hear me, Professor? Yeah, I can hear you, but whether I can understand you is another matter. All right. I mean, I'll, I'll let try me to tell you something it. about getting old. I have tinnitus. Okay. Um, Could you I'm come going, at going the front, down. please? Make up to front? Uh, yes, um, please. Okay. I'll, I'll try my best. Um, yeah, I'm specialized in chemical education and uh, I'm very interested in. Uh, what is, should be the role for you, like a scientist, to get young people more interested in science? Okay. Does it? It's much better without the microphone. All right. But yeah. there you go. I mean, one problem is the mic. Um, Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. What I'm in doing is, 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 is basically shown here in this first picture, okay, which I showed you. Um, so one thing I'm doing is I do workshops with six and seven and eight-year-old children um, around the world. And I've done these in Japan, in Germany, the USA, the dozens of them in the UK, in Malaysia, all over the world. And I do them, I'll be doing them again in Germany later in the year. To get kids to look like this, totally engrossed in something. That's one thing. But the, the main thing I'm doing is I'm trying to work as I did, and I showed you um, before, that I want young people to be creative and think about scientific issues. And um, there, which one do I want? For instance, this one. I showed you one on beetles, but here's another one on wolves by an undergraduate, okay? Recently, the first case of inbreeding that was scientifically linked to deformities in animals was released. 
This study was done by John Vucetti and Ralph Peterson with the School of Environmental Science at Michigan Technology University on a population of wolves, a very close relative of the dog. The study was conducted on a small, isolated wolf population located at Isle Royale National Park in northern Lake Superior, Michigan. The three packs are comprised of around 24 wolves, all descended from one female and one or two males, who crossed an ice bridge from Canada during an unusually cold winter in the 1940s. Since then, they have been isolated on the islands that make up the Isle Royale National Park. Let's start with that. So, these were part of my honors course at Florida State, and I asked all the students to find a little project that they were in, something that they were interested in, and uh, make a little presentation. And this remarkable one, they were all remarkable, this was perhaps the most remarkable. This is a pack of wolves that crossed onto an island in the Great Lakes when it was a very cold winter and the ice has never formed again and these wolves have been isolated for 70 years. Okay? The wolves today are all related to one female wolf and two or three males. And this is what the study has shown. In this population of 24 wolves, an average of only three pairs of wolves will breed a year. The long-term effective population size of the wolf population is approximately 3.8, and the generation time for Isle Royale wolves is about 4.3 years. Now I'm going to jump on. I'm going to show you the results of this. Okay. This graph shows the vertebrae defects in relation to the estimated birth date of the wolf. The number of deformation, deformities seems to increase significantly during the late 1980s. Buchetti and Peterson noted that for the last 12 years, every one of the wolves they found dead had some sort of bone deformation. As the population becomes more inbred, the genetic diversity continues to decrease. The photograph on the left-hand side is what a normal wolf vertebrae should look like. And this photograph on the right is the defected vertebrae. Again, in this photograph, you can clearly compare and contrast. This is the thing. Now, the way to do it is to take students and ask, let them do what interests them. I think education today is a problem because governments and government committees decide what you should know. Yeah, you've got to know something. There's definitely you have to know, have a groundwork of knowledge, but you also have to know something else. One is that to find something interesting, and Jennifer found this fantastic study where now 100% of these wolves have massive problems in their vertebrae. Now then, she goes on, however, and this is the thing, not just finding that, she goes on to put what she's interested in, okay? I realize that probably not that many people are inter interested in conservation biology, but where this subject hits home to many is in their puppy dogs. The idea that inbreeding causes deformities in animals is an issue between animal lovers and breeders. Recently, breeding facilities that produce purebred puppies in large quantities, called puppy mills, have been charged with selling unhealthy and defected dogs. Part of my motivation for choosing this topic is my love of animals. I want everyone to be aware of the atrocities that occur at puppy mills. No, stop it here. So the thing is not just to say, here's, you want to look for a project and find it interesting. It's to now take that project and put your own spin on it and add something to this. And she is particularly angry about the inbreeding and the forced breeding that we have in puppy mills, okay? But this is the interesting part. Not only did she produce something very interesting for me of this amazing study, a 70-year study in inbreeding, which you, A, you'll never be able to repeat, you will not be allowed to repeat, okay, because it would be unethical. But anyway, that's the situation. And then the big advantage is that, as I showed you before, is that um, if you look at, if you get out of here and go to this one, basically uh, then there is Jennifer and she's just got uh, into vet school. This is every advantage. So the way to do it is to encourage young people like you to, in their, your spare time really, because these were somewhat spare time projects, 
do something that fascinates you, uh, that's a scientific project, make a presentation, which we're setting up, I think, here in, this, in the school that we went to, in the Shrewsbury School, because we were there this morning, where they're very keen to do this for their students, and for you to realize that this is, in the, is the future. So it's basically finding some way of encouraging your creative potential and within the sciences, but not just the sciences, something that you personally are interested in. Thank you very much. Let's ask for the last question for Professor Croto, please. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your great lecture. Actually, this is the second time that I attended your lecture, and you still got very high quality. Yeah. Well, um, do, you, do you agree that we try too much to put the, the academic knowledge to our student, yeah. and then that's going to interfere the creativity and also imagination. Um, how how you you know do you have any idea to for us to 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 do yeah. that or uh, to solve that problem? Please. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think I did address it. I I think um, I think it, the the problem is not teaching you what to think, but how to think. And you can only do that by example. And um, I think within the sciences and within universities, it's absolutely vital that the student, uh, undergraduate students, spend time in the research labs. Because you don't learn how to think from a book. From a book you can learn what is known. What you need and what is important is that uh, for students in schools as well is that, and that we've got some examples of an amazing um, woman who's about 15 uh, in high school, but she went to a local university and worked in the research labs. And you learn how to think and how to do research and how to be creative by being in an environment that is creative. And in fact, if you think about the old masters, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, I think worked in Piero della Francesca's um, studio. So in the old days, the, 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 there were apprenticeships. And those apprenticeships were that, you know, apprentices would work in the studio of the master and would paint some things and gradually become, in some case, better than the, the master. And the research work is something similar to that, where you have a research scientist who creates a research group, and you work in that, and you work as a community. And science today is a communal activity. The days are really long gone in experimental science where you work by yourself. It's too difficult and complicated, and the equipment's uh, sometimes very complex and requires people with different types of ability. And so um, to, I think the, the emphasis should be far more on hands-on in the schools, which I'm, I think is happening. Uh, that little boy is totally engrossed in what they're doing. And that's so beautiful to see them working away, all of them working away, and trying to construct these things. But you have to be in an environment where research is being carried out. And you, you learn this osmotic, like a process of osmosis. From the surrounding, it comes in, and you, you, don't, it, you, you're not, you don't understand it's happening. But it is happening. And then you, you, the emotions come in, the discussions come in, this is wrong where you work together, and uh, something happens unexpectedly. So uh, I think there is too much uh, emphasis on um, so what a committee decides you should know, and there should be more emphasis on um, working somehow as an apprenticeship. Um, and in research, that's the case. Um, and, uh, and listening to people who have been successful, and by and large, they, they, it's not to do with uh, academic sort of thing. It's something to do with the attitude um, that is passed on from a, a teacher to a student. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor. So let's give him another big round of applause, please. <laughs> so thank you very much. I feel today very fortunate and honored to have joined this event and especially to have listened to such a wonderful lecture from him. Definitely, Dr. Chianin, I also feel the same. And now, Dr. Chianin, I think we have reached the end of this event. Yes, but before we leave, may I please take this opportunity to give great thanks to our big sponsors. First, Jackie Chan Charitable Foundation. Mercedes-Benz, Thai Airways International Public Limited Company. And Millennium Hilton Bangkok Hotel. And without all of them, the Narayson University staff, with all their hard work, without them, we couldn't have such a great event today. And of course, thank you all participants academics, lecturers, and students, and Taungam Networks for coming here today. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's time to say goodbye, and see you next year in the fifth ASEAN series. <laughs>